Welcome to ID the Future. I'm Casey Luskin, broadcasting with Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture in Seattle, Washington. Today we have on the show with us, once again, Dr. Michael Agnor, talking to us about his debates with Professor Jerry Coyne, a University of Chicago evolutionary biologist. Dr. Agnor, of course, is a professor of neurosurgery at the State University of New York, Stony Brook, where he's an award-winning doctor and brain surgeon by New York Magazine. Dr. Agnor, thanks for coming back on the show with us. Thank you, Casey. Well, as we mentioned in some previous podcasts, you've been sort of a one-man a war against Jerry Coyne's blogging. Jerry Coyne, of course, is an atheist evolutionary biologist. At his blog, Why Evolution is True, he regularly upholds sort of the classical atheistic view. He doesn't have a lot of self-censorship in terms of what I mean, that he is willing to admit some of the true implications of atheism. We just talked about, in a couple podcasts, Jerry Coyne's regular willingness to acknowledge that really Darwinian materialism leads you to reject the existence of free will and leads you to believe that everything we do is fully determined, that scientism is true, that science is the only way of gaining knowledge. We have no way of condemning moral evils like the Holocaust. We have no way of praising or even understanding moral goods like the ability of a criminal to turn their life around and repent of their violent ways. So there's a lot of stuff here that's at stake in the debate over free will and materialism, but I think that actually we're having some object lessons in the ways that Darwinian atheism leads you to behave. In particular, I'm talking about some of the incidents over the past few months where Jerry Coyne has actively supported and endorsed censorship of viewpoints that he doesn't agree with. This kind of goes back to that whole might makes right view that I think we see a lot of Darwinian atheists living out, they might deny that they believe that might makes right, but the way that they behave certainly speaks otherwise. So there have been a couple incidents of censorship over the past few months coming from Jerry Coyne. The first one has been talked about quite a bit here on ID the Future, and that is where Jerry Coyne was sort of the main instigator, at least at the beginning, behind the efforts to have Professor Eric Hedin at Ball State University prevented from being able to talk about intelligent design. Now, in that case, Dr. Coyne allied himself with a group called the Freedom from Religion Foundation, which of course goes around trying to prevent religion from having any influence in the public square. They really just want to shut down freedom of speech and freedom of for religious people to express their viewpoints. So what has Dr. Coyne done with the Freedom from Religion Foundation? What is his alliance with them? And why is that troubling to you, Dr. Egnor? Jerry Coyne is a particularly clear example of something that Darwinists and atheists have been involved in with with a great deal of vigor for many decades now. And that is that they don't want to have viewpoints that aren't consistent with atheism and Darwinism expressed in public. And they have been frantically trying to censor people. They censor people in public schools from even questioning Darwin's creation myth, from even just even asking simple questions about evolutionary science. They lobby and rally and litigate fervently to try to stop people from asking questions. So the the whole program of Coyne and many of his atheists and Darwinist colleagues has been really to shut people up, to censor people. The Freedom From Religion Foundation has been a particularly egregious participant in this kind of censorship. And Coyne's response, for example, with Eric Hayden, the professor at Ball State, who uh, was teaching a course that the students loved, that was looking at the metaphysical and philosophical issues raised by science, Cohen's response wasn't to write to Ball State and ask that they make sure that all sides are presented. And his response wasn't to write to Ball State and even request that the atheist materialist side be presented. His response was to write to Ball State and demand that they shut up, demand that they shut the course down, or face litigation, and he used the Freedom From Religion Foundation to basically blackmail Ball State, the threat of a very serious, financially devastating litigation to stop this course from being taught. And we should point out that Coyne is not a resident of the state where Ball State is located. He's not an alumnus of Ball State. He's not on the faculty. He has nothing to do with the university. And everyone taking the course was an adult who chose the course. It wasn't a mandatory course. So it was a public university that Coyne had personally nothing to do with, that gave a course, a course that was extraordinarily popular on the metaphysics of modern science, that was attended by students who were adults acting completely voluntarily 
Yet Coyne threatened to drag them into court and use the Freedom From Religion Foundation to make this threat real, and actually got the court shut down. So that it's pure censorship, and it's particularly distasteful to anybody who has any kind of respect for free public discourse or just freedom of speech. Now, there's been another incident of censorship over the past few months with Dr. Coyne, and that is at the L.A. County Museum of Natural History, where Jerry Coyne actually tried to get a sign taken down, which apparently had been provided by a donor. This was about an exhibit called the Nature Lab. And the sign simply said, the Nature Lab is a gift to Los Angeles to celebrate all of God's creatures and enable NHM, the Natural History Museum, to broaden our understanding of the natural world through the process of scientific discovery, Anonymous Donor 2013. Jerry Coyne didn't like that sign very much. What did he do, Dr. Agnor? He um, wrote the museum and made the rather bizarre claim that because this was a public museum, that there was a First Amendment problem with an anonymous donor mentioning the word God in a sign. Of course, Coyne not acknowledging that the people who were entering the museum had in God we trust on little green pieces of paper in their wallets by the thousands. I mean, the very money people would pay to get into the museum has in God we trust written on it. And that if you couldn't even mention the deity in a public arena, that you would have to tear down large parts of Washington, D.C., where the National Archives, for example, display the Declaration of Independence. I was just there last year with my son, and they have a beautiful statement there in this glass case that we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. So the fact is that throughout our nation, there are perfectly acceptable, perfectly legal references to a belief in God all over the public sphere. And Coyne threatened the museum, and they removed the sign. And the museum caved on this, which is probably because they didn't want to face the chance of financially ruinous litigation. It's just blackmail. So do you think that somehow Coyne's Darwinian materialistic worldview is playing a role in this continued push for censorship of those he disagrees with? And if so, how do you think that those two things interact? Sometimes it's useful in debates like this to sort of step back and look at the gestalt, to look at the whole debate, instead of looking at particular little points that are raised. And what one sees repeatedly, year after year, decade after decade, lawsuit after lawsuit, is a trend that's quite remarkable. Darwinists, materialists, atheists want other people to shut up. Their whole point is, we don't want people to talk about this stuff. All they want is their perspective, for example, Darwinism, given to students as a lecture without the ability to ask questions, without the ability to raise concerns, and they want to avoid debate. They're not even asking for equal time. One could imagine that if they felt that their views were not being represented fairly, which of course their views are represented more than fairly, but even if they felt they weren't being represented fairly, that an honest opponent would say, well, please, let's talk more about it. Let's have a debate about it. Let's get it out in the open. But they never want it in the open. They go to court not to make people talk more and to make people talk honestly. They go to court to make people stop talking. And the reason, of course, is that, honestly, you and I know, that their ideas will not withstand public scrutiny. If people were able, in schools and universities, to talk about Darwinism, to talk about materialism, Darwinism would collapse to dust. It is the fact that you can't discuss it candidly in the public forum, in many public forums, that allows this 19th century, really antiquated science to continue to be dominant in the scientific world. I think I agree with you that if folks are confident that the evidence is on their side, they don't usually go around trying to shut up those who they disagree with. And you're right. One single incident of censorship might not necessarily raise your eyebrows, but we see this repeating pattern over and over and over again, both in higher education and in public schools, secondary education, and even sometimes in private schools, that the Darwin lobby always has the same goal, and that is to silence those who challenge their viewpoint and prevent those who disagree from having their say. That, to me, is very suspicious. And when you look at the comparison between the Darwin lobby 
and the intelligent design community. I'm unaware of a single instance ever in the intelligent design debate in which a person favoring intelligent design has tried to censor the expression of Darwinian views or has tried to stop someone from talking about Darwin's theory. Invariably, the ID people ask for more discussion. They ask for more open debate. And it's quite a contrast to what the Darwinists do. It's interesting. Sometimes you will see people saying, well, don't ID proponents also file lawsuits? And the answer is occasionally we do, but there's an important difference in the character of the lawsuits filed by ID proponents or the educational initiatives promoted by ID proponents. When ID proponents file a lawsuit, it's always to open up freedom of speech. Somebody is shutting down free speech and we're trying to assert our free speech rights. When the Darwin lobby files lawsuits, they're always trying to shut down somebody's free speech rights, or at least that's how it's been in the last couple decades. So it's interesting to see, you can really just by looking at the nature of the suits that are filed, you can understand the different goals of the two movements. One is to always open up freedom of speech and freedom of inquiry, and the other is always to shut it down. Well, Dr. Agner, we are once again running out of time here. So I want to pick it up with one final podcast here to talk about a couple last questions in the debates that you've been having with Dr. Jerry Coyne. Are you up for that? Certainly. Certainly. I'd love it. Sounds great. Well, I'm Casey Leskin with ID the Future. Stay tuned for more with Dr. Michael Egnor. Thanks for listening.